Many of us have those stubborn pounds that seem impossible to lose, no matter how good we eat or how hard we work out. My solution is Plush Care. Plush Care is a leading telehealth provider with doctors who are there for you day and night to partner with you in your weight loss journey. They can prescribe FDA-approved weight loss medications like Wagovi and Zepbound for those who qualify. Plus, they accept most insurance plans. To get started, visit plushcare.com slash weight loss. That's plushcare.com slash weight loss. Well, hello there. I'm Nurse Mo, and this is the Straight A Nursing Podcast, where I teach concepts and share tips on how to thrive in nursing school. And because we're always students, we're always learning at the bedside too. I am, as always, really excited about this episode and hope that you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed creating it for you. Before we hop into that, though, let's take just a quick minute for our listener shout out, which goes out to Jaren's, who says this, I just graduated nursing school and was looking for a podcast that I could listen to to review what I already knew for NCLEX prep. There isn't much out there that wouldn't put me to sleep, except Nurse Mo. She is fun, engaging, and very knowledgeable. She covers content that is relevant and reviews information that I already forgot about from school. I listen to her in the car and during a workout. I only wish I had found her sooner in nursing school. However, I will continue to listen to Straight A Nursing as I become an RN. Thank you so much for submitting that feedback, that review of the podcast, and how it is helping you prepare for NCLEX. And yes, I highly endorse continuing to listen because as I said in the intro, this podcast is not just for nursing students who are in nursing school, but it is for the lifelong student because as a nurse, you are continually and always learning. So this episode today is about assessing skin signs in individuals with darker skin tones or yellow toned skin. And the reason for this is because there's just not a lot out there that is taught about how to do this. I don't know about you, but when I was in nursing school, it was very clear that what we were taught were skin assessments on white skin. And that does not even begin to cover all the patients that you will be taking care of. So let's have some more equity, some more inclusion in healthcare, and actually learn how to assess things like jaundice and cyanosis and pallor in individuals who have darker skin tones. Now, I realize I could have just rattled them off. But that might put you to sleep. And as Jaren said, we don't want that. I want to be engaging and help you stay interested in the topic and also teach you something along with it. So what we're going to do is go through a case study of a patient who comes into the ED, has some altered skin signs, has some changes in condition, and how we're going to assess them. But we're also going to learn a bit about liver disease and some other stuff that he's got going on. So, are you ready to take report? Let's do this. Your patient is Mr. Abrams, a 63-year-old black male with a history of non-alcoholic liver cirrhosis, esophageal varices, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, hypothyroidism, and renal insufficiency. He does not drink alcohol, smoke, or use recreational drugs. He is a retired elementary school teacher, married, and has two grown children. Mr. Abrams is brought to the emergency department by an ambulance. Paramedics tell you he has been complaining of shortness of breath, weakness, and dizziness, as well as some black, tarry stools for the past three days. He had a syncopal episode when he stood to get out of bed which is what prompted his wife to call 911. So your initial vital signs are a heart rate of 124, a blood pressure of 92 over 63, respiratory rate of 24 with some increased work of breathing, SpO2 of 86% on room air, 
and a temp of 36.9 degrees Celsius. So when we look at his vital signs, what are we concerned about? Several things here are out of whack, right? And the first one I'm going to get concerned about is that SpO2. It is only 86%. So we're going to place an oxy mask on Mr. Abrams. Nothing too crazy here, maybe starting around three liters per minute, which gives us about 40% FiO2. It's going to deliver that oxygen a little more efficiently than a nasal cannula. So it'll be a little bit higher than what a nasal cannula could provide at three liters per minute. Plus, they're really comfortable and just happen to be my favorite oxygen delivery device. So you place the oxy mask on Mr. Abrams and you are relieved to see some improvement in his vital signs. So his heart rate is still elevated, but a little better at 119. It was 124. Respiratory rate is down a little bit to 22, and his work of breathing is decreased, and his SpO2 is 93%. And then the other vital signs that I was concerned about would be his heart rate and his blood pressure. We know that a heart rate of 124 is tachycardic, but we're looking at a blood pressure of 92 over 63. We don't really know if that's hypotensive for Mr. Abrams without knowing where he normally runs. If I go into the doctor and my blood pressure is 92 over 63, then I would be mildly hypotensive. But if my husband went into the doctor and that was his blood pressure, he would be quite hypotensive because his natural blood pressure runs much higher than mine. So one of the questions I would want to try to find out is, where does Mr. Abrams hang out in blood pressure land? Is he normally in the 120s? Even then, 92 is low, but it's not as alarming as it would be if you learned his normal blood pressure is in the 140s or 150s. So always try to find out the patient's baseline blood pressure so that you can have an idea of how hypotensive they are. So you got the oxy mask on Mr. Abrams. His vital signs are improving a little bit. You place an IV and you draw a rainbow. And when we say we're drawing a rainbow, this means we're drawing several different colors of blood draw tubes because we're probably going to be sending out for a bunch of different labs. So in my hospital, the blue tube is for coagulation studies, the purple tube is for a CBC, and then the green top tube is for chemistry panels. So if somebody says, can you get a rainbow on my patient? You're going to get all those. In some cases, you may get a gray top tube in my facility for a lactate, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So the point here is you're sending off labs for Mr. Abrams. And in this fabulous, fictitious hospital that you work at, the labs come back very quickly and you make note of the most relevant lab results. So you right away notice that his hemoglobin is 6.4. His ALT and AST are elevated ALT is 350, AST is 505, platelets are 110,000, his prothrombin time, or PT, is 31 seconds, bilirubin is 7.7, albumin is 3, creatinine is 2.1, BUN is 78, potassium is 3.8, Glucose is 174 and TSH is 2.2. So let's go through these labs and talk about the significance of them. So he had a hemoglobin of 6.4. What does this indicate and what can we anticipate being ordered for Mr. Abrams? So a hemoglobin of 6.4 is low and it's low because we're pretty sure he's bleeding from the GI tract. And what makes us think he's bleeding from the GI tract? We'll go back up into our scenario. What was he complaining about? He was fatigued, he was dizzy, and he had been having dark, tarry stools for about three days. Dark and tarry stools are a sign of GI bleeding. And then what can we anticipate the MD ordering for a patient 
who looks like they're having a GI bleed, and their hemoglobin is below 7. We can anticipate the MD ordering a type and cross along with a blood transfusion. Very good. So next is the ALT and the AST. They were elevated. What does this indicate? So the ALT and the AST are elevated because he has liver disease. So even though this is abnormal, it's kind of expected for his past medical history. What about that platelet count of 110,000? What does that indicate? So that is a low platelet count, and it indicates the patient is at risk for bleeding. And platelets are low in liver disease due to sequestration of platelets in the spleen, as well as reduced thrombopoiesis in the bone marrow. So your patient with chronic liver disease, you always want to check their platelets so that you can have an idea of how at risk for bleeding they are. He's at pretty good risk. Okay, next was the prothrombin time. What did that indicate? It was 31 seconds. Is that normal? Is that abnormal? So hopefully you knew that was abnormal and that it was too high. That means we have increased clotting times. And when we have increased clotting times, what does that mean for our bleeding risk? That bleeding risk is going to go up. And this is common in patients with liver disease due to the liver not being able to function properly and make adequate clotting factors. So not only do we not have enough platelets, now we don't have enough clotting factors, we're high risk for bleeding. Next up was the bilirubin at 7.7. Is this good? Is this bad? What does this indicate? So this would be pretty elevated bilirubin, which he has because he has chronic liver disease. And then he also has an albumin level of 3.0. What does that indicate? So think about where albumin is produced in the body. And if you don't remember, and I say it's produced in the liver, would you think, oh, that makes sense. So it's going to be a low level. Albumin of 3.0 is a low level. Your patient with chronic liver disease often has a low albumin level. Why do we care so much about that? Well, without albumin, which is a circulating plasma protein, the patient is at risk for edema and fluid accumulation in the abdomen due to third spacing. There's just not enough oncotic pressure in the vasculature to keep that fluid inside the vasculature where you want it to be. It can leak out. So they get edema in the periphery and fluid accumulation in the abdomen, which is called ascites. Okay, next up was the creatinine of 2.1. What does that indicate? So first, is that too high, too low, just fine? That is too high. An elevated creatinine level is associated with the patient's renal insufficiency. Remember, he had renal insufficiency in his past medical history. Now, some medications can cause creatinine to become elevated, so we'd want to just have that in the back of our mind. And then in a lot of cases, the patient may need dose adjustments on some of their other medications, especially if that medication is heavily excreted by the kidneys. So for example, if you have a patient with elevated creatinine and they're getting anoxaparin, you need to check and make sure that they have renal dosing of their anoxaparin because that medication is reliant on kidney excretion. And if the kidneys aren't functioning properly, then we're just going to have way too much anoxaparin floating around in the body, and that would put the patient at higher risk for bleeding. So we care about creatinine because we care obviously about renal function, right? When creatinine is up, that means renal function is down. And with impaired renal function, we may need to adjust doses on certain medications we may even need to look and see if some medications need to be stopped or changed to something else that doesn't affect the kidneys negatively. We're also going to keep a close eye on urine output. If the kidneys aren't functioning properly, the patient's at risk for decreased urine output, which means they're at risk for fluid overload. 
They're also at risk for electrolyte imbalances. So creatinine is one of those that we look at pretty much in everyone, definitely in a patient with a history of renal insufficiency. And then his BUN is elevated at 78. Why is this? What does that indicate? So obviously he's got some chronic renal insufficiency. That could be why his BUN is elevated. But let's look at this a little more closely and look at the BUN creatinine ratio. So don't worry about stopping and pulling over and doing math. The BUN creatinine ratio for Mr. Abrams is 37.14. So here's what that indicates. In a patient with a GI bleed, a BUN creatinine ratio equal to or above 36 is indicative of an upper GI bleed whereas lower numbers are indicative of a lower GI bleed. And the reason for this is that BUN increases because blood is full of proteins, which are absorbed in the GI tract in a GI bleed. And when the bleed is in the upper GI tract, there is time for adequate absorption of these proteins. And if you recall, BUN, which stands for blood urea nitrogen, It reflects the end product of protein breakdown. So more protein absorption, more protein breakdown. We have an increase in urea, which causes the BUN to be elevated. Voila, upper GI bleed. Okay, what about the potassium level? Mr. Abrams has a potassium level of 3.8. Why do we care about that? So we care about the potassium level because he has chronic renal insufficiency. And even though this potassium level is normal, it's still significant because with chronic renal insufficiency, he is at risk for hyperkalemia. And we care about hyperkalemia because it can cause some dangerous cardiac arrhythmias. And then what about that blood glucose level? It is 174. So what does that indicate? Now we know he has a history of type two diabetes, We also want to be aware though, just because that blood glucose level is high, I want you to be aware that in patients with especially advanced liver disease, the blood glucose level is often low. They are often hypoglycemic due to impaired gluconeogenesis. Now, Mr. Abrams doesn't have that problem at this time. As his liver disease progresses, he definitely could become hypoglycemic. But right now, he's not hypoglycemic. His blood glucose level is 174, which indicates that either the medications he's taking for blood glucose control are inadequate or he's having a stress response to all this illness and bleeding that is going on and possibly a combination of both. And then his TSH level is 2.2. Why do we care about that? Well, the TSH was drawn because of his history of hypothyroidism, and this is a normal level, indicating he is on the proper dose of his medication for that hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism would not be an explanation for why he is so fatigued. It's really looking like GI bleed. Now, earlier I mentioned that we could anticipate the MD ordering a type and cross and a blood transfusion for this patient. You've probably heard type and screen. You've probably heard type and cross. And if you're not sure what the difference is, it's okay. I didn't understand that either when I was new. So let's talk quickly about that. So there are three components here. The typing part or the ABO blood typing, the screening component, and the cross matching component. So blood typing is done to determine the patient's blood type, like A positive or B negative. Now, if the MD thinks the patient might need blood at some point, but not really sure, it's not indicated right now, but it could be later, then a type and screen is ordered. This test determines the patient's ABO blood type and screens for the presence of antibodies against red blood cell antigens. A type and screen does not reserve units of blood for the patient because, again, they don't necessarily need the blood right now. They just maybe could. And then a type and cross adds an additional step, which is the cross match. 
And in this step, the recipient's blood is cross-matched against specific potential donor blood units. And the patient will either have blood actually ordered at this time or an order to place a hold on a certain number of units if transfusion is imminent. Let's say they're going into surgery. So that's the difference between a type and cross and a type and screen. All right, well, it's time for your 15-minute break. So the break relief nurse is going to send you on a quick little break. And then when you get back, you're going to check back in on Mr. Abrams. Hello, listeners. This is Ann Bogle, author, blogger, and creator of the podcast, What Should I Read Next? Since 2016, I've been helping readers bring more joy and delight into their reading lives. Every week, I tackle all things books and reading with a guest and guide them in discovering their next read. They share three books they love, one book they don't, and what they've been reading lately. And I recommend three titles they may enjoy reading next. Guests have said our conversations are like therapy, troubleshooting issues that have plagued their reading lives for years and possibly the rest of their lives as well. And of course, recommending books that meet the moment, whether they are looking for deep introspection to spur or encourage a life change or a frothy page turner to help them escape the stresses of work, school, everything. You'll learn something about yourself as a reader, and you'll definitely walk away confident to choose your next read with a whole list of new books and authors to try. So join us each Tuesday for What Should I Read Next? Subscribe now wherever you're listening to this podcast and visit our website, What Should I Read Next? Podcast.com to find out more. All righty, you're back from your break. You're checking on Mr. Abrams, and by now, Mrs. Abrams has arrived and is able to provide some more information about her husband's home medications, which, bless her, she has actually brought in with her. You inspect the pill bottles and note that Mr. Abrams takes metoprolol, hydralazine, levothyroxine, metformin, furosemide, naproxen, and atorvastatin. So let's go through each of these and knowing what we know about him so far, see if we can figure out why he's taking each of these medications. So first of all, metoprolol. What's in his past medical history that needs metoprolol? So let's really quickly go back and just review his past medical history. He has non-alcoholic liver cirrhosis, esophageal varices, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, hypothyroidism, and renal insufficiency. So why is he taking metoprolol? For his hypertension. Very good. And then what are the two parameters you want to always measure before and after you give metoprolol? You're always looking at their blood pressure and the heart rate because metoprolol can cause bradycardia. So you check that before, if you're all good, you give them a toprolol, and then you check it afterwards. What about hydralazine? Why would he take hydralazine? Hydralazine is also for hypertension. Good job. So now we're reminded that Mr. Abrams has hypertension. That blood pressure of 92 might be pretty low for him. Okay, what about levothyroxine? Why is he taking that? That is for hypothyroidism. That is a thyroid hormone replacement. What about the medication metformin? What condition does he have that utilizes that? That is for type 2 diabetes. Very good. And then what about furosemide? He doesn't have heart failure, so why might he be taking furosemide? So remember, patients with chronic liver disease can get edema and get ascites from third spacing fluids. So to help reduce that, some patients take furosemide. So now that we know he takes furosemide, what labs are we going to go double check? We're going to go double check creatinine and potassium. Remember, furosemide is a loop diuretic. And what do loop diuretics do to potassium? It causes potassium losses. So we want to make sure his potassium level is not too low. And what does furosemide do to creatinine? 
it can cause creatinine to increase. So maybe Mr. Abrams' renal insufficiency is from taking furosemide for years. Maybe. I don't know. All right. The next one is naproxen. Why would he be taking that medication? Well, he has a history of osteoarthritis, so that makes sense. What about a torvastatin? That is a statin medication used to treat hyperlipidemia. So looking back at these medications that Mrs. Abrams brought in, which one of these is a real red flag for you? So for me, and hopefully for you too, the red flag medication is naproxen, that NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, because NSAIDs are associated with GI bleeding. Not only can NSAIDs cause peptic ulcers to form and then bleed, studies show it can also contribute to the bleeding of esophageal varices. Since esophageal varices develop in patients with liver disease, and this happens because of portal hypertension, Mr. Abrams has low platelets and an elevated prothrombin time. Are we super concerned about the use of this medication? Oh, yes, we are super concerned about his use of this medication, 1,000%. So now that we know we're concerned about the naproxen, what are we going to ask his wife about this medication? Basically, we want to know how much of this medication he is using. How often is he taking it? And guess what? She tells you, oh, Bobby takes it multiple times a day, and he's been doing that for a long time for his arthritis. I don't know why I suddenly went Southern there. I'm originally from (laughs) Oklahoma. That's where I was born. Um, that, That was my Oklahoma coming out. Anyway, that's what she says. He takes it multiple times a day and has done so for a while for his osteoarthritis. Has our concern level just shot through the roof? Oh, yeah, it absolutely has. So if you had to write a nursing care plan, for Mr. Abrams and include a knowledge deficit problem. This would be the knowledge deficit problem that he has. And it would be something like knowledge deficit related to naproxen use concurrent with liver disease as evidenced by wife's statement that patient takes naproxen multiple times a day and has done so for a long time. That would be our problem statement. And then our expected outcome must also be knowledge-based. It has to be something about his knowledge. So the outcome could be something like, Mr. Abrams will state understanding that naproxen is contraindicated for him in the presence of liver disease due to the risk for GI bleeding by the end of this shift. There we go. There's our SMART objective for Mr. Abrams. And then some interventions for that. The interventions need to be knowledge-based as well. So we're going to, maybe we're going to assess Mr. Abrams' understanding in general about NSAIDs and (laughs) medications that are not good for him to take. Like, where are you at with understanding this, Mr. Abrams? So assess his current level of understanding. We're going to provide education about why he is not to take naproxen And then how about we educate on some alternative pain management strategies for him? So there we go. All of our interventions are knowledge-based. I realize I just went off on a care plan tangent, but you know what? As nurses, you're care planning in the moment constantly, so we might as well take a detour every now and then here on the podcast. So at this point, we've welcomed Mr. Abrams and his lovely wife into the ED We've taken a set of vital signs, placed Mr. Abrams on some oxygen, seen a little bit of improvement, sent off some labs, got them back shockingly quickly, analyzed those, and we've also talked with Mrs. Abrams about the medications that her husband is taking. Now we're going to do a physical assessment. So we do our head-to-toe assessment on Mr. Abrams. And the significant things that we find are that he is lethargic and he is disoriented to time and situation. We try reorienting him 
but repeat assessment shows he continues to be confused. His heart sounds are normal, but his pulse is weak and fast. It's in the mid-120s, and capillary refill is right at three seconds. He is tachypnic, he's complaining of shortness of breath, and speaking in like three to four word sentences, so definitely short of breath. He has accessory muscle use present, so increased work of breathing, but his lungs sound normal. His abdomen is moderately distended with caput medusae present. He also shows 2 plus edema in bilateral lower extremities, and skin signs reveal jaundice and pallor. Finally, we got to the skin signs. So let's kind of think about our assessment findings. So first off, he's lethargic. Why do we think he's lethargic? He's lethargic most likely because of anemia secondary to that GI bleed. What about that disorientation? He's disoriented to time and situation. So one simple explanation is that he lost consciousness at home, but woke up in an ambulance, and now he's in the emergency room. This would be disorienting for anyone, and that's why we tried to reorient him. But repeat assessment showed he still didn't really know what day it was or what was going on. That's because hypoxia causes confusion. And that's definitely a concern for Mr. Abrams. And then we assessed his pulse. It was weak. Why is his pulse weak? We understand why it's fast because he's tachycardic in response to that lower blood pressure. But why is it weak? So that pulse is weak because of reduced cardiac output. So he has low circulating blood volume, which is going to do what to preload? Preload's going to be reduced as well. And when we have reduced preload, what does that do to cardiac stretch? It's not going to be super stretched. There's just not enough volume to get good stretch. So when we don't have a lot of stretch, what does that do to cardiac contractility? It reduces it. And if we have reduced contractility, what does that do to cardiac output? Cardiac output is reduced. So that is why his pulse is weak. What else was in his physical assessment? Oh, his capillary refill, right at three seconds. Are we concerned about this? So we're concerned about this. This is like right there at the edge of a normal capillary refill. Any further blood loss, and we do not know if he's still bleeding or not, any further blood loss is going to affect this even more. So yes, we're definitely concerned. And then he was also tachypnic, short of breath, and using accessory muscles. Why is that? So remember, his hemoglobin is low. What was it, 6.4? So we have less oxygen being delivered to the tissues, so he's hypoxic. So the body's going to respond to that by kicking up the respiratory rate, and his work of breathing has also increased. And all of this together is going to make him feel short of breath, the hypoxia, the tachypnea, and the increased work of breathing. Now looking down at his belly, why is his abdomen distended? And we touched on this a little bit earlier. So patients with chronic liver disease have increased portal hypertension and low circulating plasma proteins. Remember, albumin was low also. So what does this mean? This means fluid is easily lost into the abdomen due to third spacing, and that is a condition called ascites. Increased vascular pressure can also cause an enlarged spleen, and the liver is likely enlarged as well in someone with chronic liver disease. So both an enlarged spleen and an enlarged liver could also cause that abdominal enlargement. Note that when the ascites is significant, the belly can get really, really big and actually impede on the ability to take good lung volumes in, to take in good breaths. So we would want to watch him very closely if the ascites progressed and got a lot worse. We'd watch him closely for 
difficulty taking a deep breath, and associated respiratory compromise. But the short version is his belly's distended because of ascites and possibly splenomegaly and hepatomegaly. We also saw that he had caput medusae. So what is that? That is a condition that is associated with portal hypertension and is due to the shunting of blood through umbilical veins, which become engorged and visible on the surface. And we also noticed he had two plus pitting edema in the bilateral lower extremities. Why is that? We talked about this earlier too. Mr. Abrams has low serum albumin and therefore low circulating plasma proteins. And this means oncotic pressure is decreased and fluid is able to leak into the interstitial space. You'll hear this called third spacing. That is when the fluid leaves the intravascular space, becomes physiologically inert. It goes into the interstitial space. It can actually become physiologically detrimental, um, but it's definitely not contributing to cardiac output at that time. So that's why he has two plus pitting edema in his bilateral lower extremities. Now getting to our skin signs. We noticed Mr. Abrams was jaundiced. So how do we assess for jaundice in Mr. Abrams? So in individuals with dark skin or in individuals with yellow toned skin, the best place to look for jaundice is the sclera. So look at the eyes. You're looking at the sclera of the eye. Note that if a patient with darker skin has calluses on the soles of their feet or the palms of their hands, these calluses can appear yellowish. This does not indicate jaundice. They can be yellowish without jaundice being present. So if you've got somebody who likes to go rock climbing, I don't know if you've ever been indoor rock climbing. I'm assuming outdoor rock climbing would do the same. But when I used to do it, my hand, I had calluses all over my hands. So you've got a patient who's a rock climber with darker skin. It's yellowish. Does not mean they have jaundice. We're going to look at the sclera. You can also observe for a yellow discoloration of the oral mucosa by looking at the hard palate. You could see the jaundice there as well. And what does jaundice indicate? A buildup of bilirubin in the blood. So in a patient with darker skin, you're not necessarily going to see that yellowness like you would see in somebody with lighter skin. Again, you're going to look at the sclera and look at the hard palate. And then we also noted that Mr. Abrams showed pallor. How do we assess pallor in somebody with darker skin? And assessing for pallor in individuals with darker skin tones can be difficult. The mucous membranes of very dark-skinned individuals is probably where you want to go. It's going to appear ashen or grayish, while in a individual with more brown skin tones, the color would be more of a yellowish brown. Okay, so you're looking for a pallor there. It's going to be something you have to actively go and look for. You can also observe the palmer surface, which could appear paler than usual. And you can ask Mrs. Abrams, are his palms always this light? And she might say, oh yeah, his palms are always that light. Or she might say, oh no, they're usually darker than that. You can always ask the patient or somebody who knows them well. One key thing to note about assessing for pallor is that fluorescent lighting can really mess this up. It's going to give the skin like a weird blue tinge. So if you can use a halogen lamp or just natural light, get near a window if possible and assess that way. Okay, so now let's go back and check in on Mr. Abrams. So you're going to call the MD. You're calling the MD to let her know that Mr. Abrams' labs have resulted. While you're doing that, you hear a scream coming from his bay. You rush over there to see Mrs. Abrams shouting, he's bleeding, he's bleeding, and she's right. Mr. Abrams is vomiting bright red blood. Thankfully, Dr. Jones has also heard all this commotion and is rushing to the bedside. She orders an emergent blood transfusion and calls for a central line kit while you suction the oropharynx and maintain Mr. Abrams in a side-lying position. 
The central line is inserted and secured just as the four units of unmatched O negative blood are delivered to his bay. Dr. Jones has ordered a stat chest x-ray and the technician has also just shown up. At this time, you notice cyanotic skin signs and the monitor reveals a heart rate of 132, blood pressure 76 over 43, Respiratory rate, 28, SpO2, 72% on that 3 liters oxy mask. So obviously, Mr. Abrams has taken a turn for the worse. What is the significance of him vomiting the bright red blood? So the blood is bright red because it is fresh, meaning the bleeding is happening right now. You may hear this called Frank bleeding. Frank bleeding means bright red, happening right now. The fact that he is vomiting the blood tells us this is an upper GI bleed, possibly from esophageal varices or a bleeding ulcer, or maybe even both. Next question I have for you is, why did the blood bank send up O negative blood? So O negative blood is that universal donor blood and can be administered in emergency situations without a type and screen or type and cross match. We don't have time for that with Mr. Abrams. He needs blood right now. He's going to get emergency blood transfusion. And what's going on with his blood pressure? It went down to 76 over 43. Well, that one's pretty simple. His blood pressure has dropped due to a loss of circulating volume. Now, when we look at his blood pressure, does he need volume to improve his blood pressure? Or do we need to give a medication like norepinephrine, which is a vasopressor, to improve his blood pressure? Mr. Abrams needs volume. The blood transfusions are going to help. He's probably going to get fluids at the same time. We need to increase circulating volume quickly to avoid circulatory collapse, especially since it appears he's actively hemorrhaging. Now, you might be wondering, why did Dr. Jones insert a central venous catheter or a central line? So a central venous catheter allows for the rapid infusion of blood and fluids. Plus, a patient with a blood pressure in the 70s is going to have very flat peripheral veins, finding a vein is going to be very difficult for a peripheral IV. So we're going to get in a central venous catheter with multiple lumens. We can give all kinds of stuff at the same time and resuscitate his volume quickly. And then the other thing was that you noticed cyanosis in Mr. Abrams. How do we assess for cyanosis in someone with darker skin? Are they going to look bluish? Not necessarily. In dark-skinned individuals, Cyanosis is most likely to be noticed as a gray or whitish tint around the mouth or a blue or grayish discoloration of the conjunctiva. Do you have to go looking for those things and know what you're looking for? 100% yes. Now, what if Mr. Abrams had more yellow toned skin? How would we assess for cyanosis then? So in individuals with yellow skin tones, cyanosis actually presents as a grayish, greenish color. And this is why you absolutely have to know how to notice and find abnormal skin signs in non-white skin because grayish or greenish, that's not what we're taught in nursing school. We're taught cyanosis is blue and you would miss a significant assessment finding on your patient if you didn't. No, to look for these other signs. All right. And then you might have noticed that Dr. Jones ordered a stat chest x ray. Why did she do that? So, a chest x ray is used to verify position of that central venous catheter. And we do that once it's placed prior to using it. The MD looks at the film, says, okay, the central venous catheter is okay to use puts that in as a nursing communication order, and then we know we're good to use this catheter. And then what's going on with vital signs? So what happened there? The heart rate went up to 132. We talked about the blood pressure, or did we? 
Yes, we did. We talked about the blood pressure. Um, what else is happening with his vital signs? His SpO2 went down. So that's concerning, right? Hopefully you're concerned about that, just like I would be. So at this point, I'm going to escalate my oxygen delivery. He is in the 70s, the low 70s, 72% with a bit of supplemental oxygen. I'm probably grabbing the non-rebreather, cranking that sucker up to 100%, and I'm going to see how he does. Depending on how he responds, this may be sufficient, but he may need advanced oxygen care, oxygen delivery with intubation and mechanical ventilation. So what is next for Mr. Abrams? Luckily, he maintains a good oxygen saturation level on that non-rebreather for now. And Dr. Jones calls the gastroenterologist who is on call to tell him that Mr. Abrams needs a STAT EGD or upper endoscopy. The GI specialist orders a pantoprazole infusion and an octreotide infusion to be started immediately and tells Dr. Jones that the endo team will be there in 60 minutes. Oh my gosh, that's a long time. So even though the transfusion and fluids at this point are starting to help Mr. Abrams and his blood pressure is starting to come up, it still hasn't risen above 88 systolic. And Dr. Jones knows that patients can bleed out quickly. She calls for two things, an intubation tray and a Blakemore tube. So Mr. Abrams is intubated, and then Dr. Jones places the Blakemore tube herself. Once that nasogastric tube, that special nasogastric tube, is set to intermittent low wall suction, you see initial drainage of blood and some stuff that kind of looks like coffee grounds, but after a little bit, it appears to slow down and you breathe a sigh of relief. It feels like maybe we've bought Mr. Abrams some time here. So let's talk about what the gastroenterologist ordered. What is the purpose of pantoprazole in GI bleeds? So pantoprazole is used in upper GI bleeds to reduce gastric acid secretion and minimize the effects of gastric acid on platelet aggregation. So basically, if we reduce gastric acid, then we reduce the risk of bleeding because platelets are able to aggregate adequately. Okay, does that make sense? And then what about octreotide? What is the purpose of that? So octreotide inhibits vasodilatory hormones. And what this does is it reduces blood flow in the GI tract, along with portal and variceal pressures. So it's going to reduce blood flow in the GI tract and reduce portal and variceal pressures. And what this means is reduced bleeding from esophageal varices. So this medication could potentially be life-saving for Mr. Abrams. Now you might be wondering, well, why was Mr. Abrams intubated? He seemed to be doing okay with the non-rebreather and he was getting blood. Basically, Mr. Abrams was intubated for airway protection. If someone's going to require a Blakemore tube, it's because they are bleeding. And we'll talk about Blakemore tubes in just a moment. And if someone's bleeding from an esophageal varices, guess what? We're concerned about their airway. So let's now talk about that Blakemore tube. What's its purpose? So not as common as they once were, thanks to some really cool endoscopic procedures that we're going to talk about here in just a moment. A Sangstaken Blakemore tube is a special type of nasogastric tube, and it has two inflatable balloons. So one is a balloon in the stomach. So it's the part of the tube that's down in the stomach. There's a balloon there. Once that's inflated, it helps reduce blood flow to those esophageal varices, which can help reduce the bleeding. And then if it's still needed, there's another balloon located along the length of the tubing, and that can be inflated to put some gentle pressure and help tamponade those esophageal varices so they stop bleeding. And then just like a regular nasogastric tube, there's an opening at the bottom for drainage of gastric contents. So he's got the Blakemore tube in place to stop this hemorrhage while we wait for the endo team to arrive. And just in general, why did Dr. Jones consult the gastroenterologist? 
With bleeding of any kind, the most important intervention is to make it stop. So that Blakemore tube is really only a temporary measure because it's not really used for more than about six hours. And then once the balloon is deflated, the patient can re-bleed. We absolutely have to get in there and do something definitive. So we talked about the gastroenterologist coming in for an EGD. And let's see if I can pronounce this. Esophagogastroduodenoscopy. You know what? I think I did pretty good. But we just say EGD. And sometimes you may just hear this called an upper endoscopy or an upper scope. We just love abbreviating things in the clinical setting. And what this does is it enables the gastroenterologist to look down into the esophagus and into the upper GI tract and locate and stop the bleeding through various techniques such as clipping, or band ligation, or injecting localized epinephrine, which constricts the bleeding vessels and causes the bleeding to stop. So that's why we've called the gastroenterologist, and that's the procedure that they're going to come do. And then what's up with that coffee ground stuff coming from the NG tube? So when blood sits in the stomach, it coagulates, giving it this coffee ground appearance. Sometimes patients will vomit this substance, and you'll hear the term coffee ground emesis. So if you see coffee ground emesis, I want you to think GI bleed. Okay, help is finally here to save the day. At this point, Mr. Abrams is in the hands of the endoscopy team who have decided we're just going to come straight to the bedside in the ER and do this procedure. As the primary nurse, you monitor Mr. Abrams' vital signs, and since he's now intubated, you manage his sedation through a continuous infusion of propofol and fentanyl. And the procedure takes about an hour, and you realize as the team is finishing up that the combined time that Mr. Abrams has been lying in a supine position is, has kind of added up. So before transferring him to the ICU, you perform a skin assessment to look for early signs of pressure injury. Thankfully, you don't find any, but it's a good thing that you went and looked. You transport Mr. Abrams to the ICU for close monitoring and are really happy to see much, much improved vital signs. His heart rate is 84. His blood pressure is 110 systolic. Respiratory rate is 18 SpO2 is 98% on the ventilator at 40% FiO2, and you anticipate Mr. Abrams being extubated in the ICU once that propofol and fentanyl wear off and probably even going to the med surge floor tomorrow. Good job. So a couple questions about this part of the scenario. Why are fentanyl and propofol often used together? So the reason we use these together is because they kind of do different things. Propofol is going to provide our patient with sedation, but it doesn't do anything about pain. And then fentanyl provides pain management and a little bit of sedation. So used together, the patient is sedated and pain is managed. And then the other question is back to our skin assessment. How do you assess for a stage one pressure injury in a patient with dark skin like Mr. Abrams? So in a patient with lighter skin, you assess for a stage one pressure injury by checking for non-blanching erythema, right? You see a spot of redness, you touch it, you see if it blanches. If it blanches, you're okay, but you really should do some interventions because you got close there. If it doesn't blanch, you've got a stage one pressure injury. Now, Darker skin's not going to show that blanching, even when it's healthy. So checking for non-blanching erythema isn't going to work here. In fact, erythema may not even be noticeable. So you check the area for variations in skin color, like throughout the area. And note that the affected location may be warmer or cooler than surrounding tissue, maybe a little darker maybe firmer than the surrounding tissue, maybe have some edema or bogginess to it, or even be painful. So when you're looking for pressure injury on a patient with darker skin, 
it's going to take more effort. You've got to go in and you have to look much, much more closely. All right, how about a happy ending? Mr. Abrams is extubated later that day and shows no signs of further bleeding or hemodynamic compromise. He is provided education about avoiding NSAIDs and taught to recognize the signs of GI bleeding should they occur in the future. And he's discharged home after a three-day hospital stay. Great job working with Mr. Abrams. I sincerely hope you found this helpful, not just for learning about assessing for skin signs in darker skin tones, but also because maybe you learned something about liver disease or GI bleeds or just enjoy thinking through a case study. So I have not actually firmly decided what I'm talking about next week. I know I usually like to give you a little teaser sneak peek into it, but guess what? Here's the teaser sneak peek. It's going to be a surprise. It'll be a surprise for me too, because I'll figure it out tomorrow when I go to record this episode. I do hope to see you back here next week for whatever we end up talking about. And if you're subscribed or following the show, then each episode shows up like magic for you every Thursday, as well as any bonus episodes that I throw your way. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you soon. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing, a proud member of the Airwave Media Network. For more educational podcasts, check out airwavemedia.com. And for more nursing-related content, go to straightanursingstudent.com. 